This is as good as my hair looks the entire video. Today's topic is on framework. The illusion of choice. Genesis done. What Nintendo? Bad faith arguments. But if you want a quality of outcome, you can suck my dick. <laughs> That's nonsense. There's no such thing as a quality of outcome. Equality of outcome. Quality of outcome. <laughs> And they sure ain't never gonna learn. Ahoy hoy, I'm Luna, and this is really awkward. Uh, so, the entirety of this concept is built upon the work of one dude, uh, Milton Friedman, who I'll be addressing at the end of this video, so stay tuned. To start, Friedman notes a particular set of definitions for the different types of equality. We have equality before God, equality of opportunity, and equality of outcome. I haven't seen any arguments for equality of outcome, like anywhere. They have this guy on Fox, like, denigrating the idea. You can be told by Democrats that having somebody else pay for your health care, your food, your phone, your housing, your education is a right, and that you have the right to demand it because it must be supplied by somebody else. What we say is you have equality of opportunity, but not equality of results. What Democrats want to do, mostly through government policies, is preserve equality of results. Well, the fact is equal opportunity does not equal equal results. There are plenty of young performers out there who'd like to be Ashton Kutcher today. Kutcher. Sure. They're not as good you know, as Bernard, him, so he gets the millions and they don't. What? We have strange articles on Fox News about it. Actually, let's de dive like real deep down uh, into the article I found. It kind of lays out the core of this argument and cites some very interesting sources. To quote Wendy McElroy in her article, Equal Access Does Not equal gu uh, Guarantee Equal Outcome, which is titled reasonably enough. If a majority of women do not choose a political career, if most women voters do not cast ballots for their own sex, this is a fascinating social pattern, but it doesn't necessarily say anything about women's equality. It only reveals women's preferences. Nevertheless, politically correct feminists will proclaim that the election results reflect the oppression of women. The definition of equality has changed once more to mean equality of outcome, not of opportunity or access. Election results will probably be included, if only indirectly. For example, in Kosovo, the UN mandated a gender quota. She then links to ifeminist.com, a website owned uh, by her, and it's a blog post by her. And it's summed up by saying, person wrongly equates election rigging by stacking nominations with political clones and making sure that a representative government represents the population it's supposed to represent. And it's completely ridiculous and it doesn't support this point, but Let's check out her ideological source. Dr. Mark Cure has well expressed the difference between various concepts of equality within feminism. Equality of opportunity provides in a sense that all start the race of life at the same time. Equality of outcome attempts to ensure that everyone finishes at the same time. Cure considers equality of opportunity and freedom to be two facets of the same basic concept. Equality of results, however, is the goal of radical socialism. Oh dear, radical socialism. That sounds scary. Let's check in on that link here. Equality of opportunity in the sense of identical opportunity for all individuals is impossible. Good start. Equality of opportunity provides in a sense that all start the race of life at the same time. Equality of outcome attempts to ensure that everyone finishes at the same time. Uh, to slightly change what the dodo said in Alice in Wonderland, 
Everybody must win and all must have prizes. Hey, Ben Nathan. Everyone. The, the, the time has come. Let's see if Milton Friedman shows up in the rest of this site. Let's check the bibliography for this book. And Friedman shows up three times and I don't need to read any further. Oh my god, I've struck gold. Alright, so let's just pretend all this didn't happen. Let's just go back to the home page of this wonderful little web 2.0 looking site that was apparently at last updated in January of 2019. That's kind of surprising. Well, we have here, how would I know if my civilization is declining? Uh, let's see their diagnosis for the decline of civilization. Decline may be diagnosed by applying any of the following methods. One, determine if the general use of language is losing discipline, for this can only mean the general use of thought is also losing discipline, which is the decay of understanding. Uh, there's also a quote by George Orwell, and we will get back to that, because what? Two, determine if the community is discarding or corrupting traditional beliefs about right and wrong. For these beliefs supply sanity, so their destruction must win the collapse of order and the loss of communal identity. Communal identity? Perhaps he's talking about collective re- oh no. For the moment the majority becomes selfish, traditions are discarded along with concern for their racial character. That is, the community loses both its sanity and its racial identity, its nationality. The citizens of Western civilization no longer pride themselves on being white Christians and their once separate nations have become merely a mass of insane humanity with no religion or distinct racial character. Oh my god, that got fashy in a hurry. Moving on. Number three, consider the attitude of children uh, toward their parents. I've seen this talking point a lot. Uh, the idea that children must be subservient to their parents and that parents should be like cold and uncaring. It's really bizarre, so I'm not surprised that it's here. Number four, determine if the community is losing its racial identity, nationality, for this means it is being invaded by other communities. There's a link to that page on nationalism again. Oof. Number five, determine if the community has become matrist in nature by invoking the rules outlined in sex and history by G.R. Taylor. Uh, permissive versus restrictive views on sexuality. That makes sense as a dichotomy. We've got sex differences maximized, dress, and minimized, respectively, which I guess, like, I assume that means that women dressed more modestly back in the day? I don't, it's really hard to tell. Also, politically authoritarian versus politically democratic. Showing your hand again. Uh, limitation of freedom for women and freedom for women. Wow. Deep fear of homosexuality. That's pretty normal for concern. It's contrasted against fear of incest. Wow. Moving on. Number six, use one of Arnold Toynbee's methods outlined in a study of history which claimed that one, the first eruption of a class war marked the onset of decline, and two, a declining civilization will be attacked by barbarian war bands. A graphic example of such an attack on Western civilization being 9-11. And let's get back to that Orwell quote. Decay in the general use of language becomes the indisputable hallmark of a declining civilization. As George Orwell put it, a man may take to drink because he feels himself to be a failure, and then fail all the more completely because he drinks. It is rather the same thing that is happening to the English language from politics and the English language. You quoted Orwell to decry socialism. 
You've got to be kidding me. Orwell was an anarchist and a socialist, Dillweed. That particular essay is, let's leave it at somewhat problematic, but the ideas within certainly hold some water. Uh, let's see what's actually being said here. It's saying that people in power frequently use foreign tongues, ancient terminology, and excessive verbosity as euphemistic language to get across horrific ideas. Now who would be caught dead doing that? Let's get back to talking about this equality of outcome. I have seen how much many people talking about Jordan Peterson's talking points, but he's, like, a really long-winded. I'm just looking at specifically where this weird talking point came from, and he kinda seems like the expert on it, so I kinda have to talk about him. We good? Otherwise, you're gonna have to go your own way. Here's the problem, man. You get somebody, you get somebody saying, race or ethnicity, group member X is detestable because of their group identity, and you think, evil Nazi, but then you see someone saying, well, I just wish that everybody could have an equal outcome. Well, what are you going to do? You're gonna, are you going to punch them? That's what you're supposed to do with Nazis. No, you're not. You're going to think, oh, that's a pretty nice person. And it's like, just because you're nice doesn't mean you're good. What is the connection? How much tyranny you have to impose in order to produce something like equality of outcome. The, the, and Thomas Sowell's talked about this a little bit too. He said, what the people who are agitating for equality of outcome don't understand is that you have to cede so much power to the authorities, to the government, in order to ensure equality of outcome that a tyranny is inevitable. Thomas Sowell, you say. Let's see what he has to say. As a teenager, I tried briefly to play basketball, but I was lucky to hit the backboard, much less the basket. Yet, I had just as much opportunity to play basketball as Michael Jordan had, but equal opportunity was not nearly enough to create equal outcomes. To maintain any system of ascribed status from the top is going to mean reducing people's freedom across the spectrum. Oh wait, I get it now. It's a straw man argument. That can't be it. Let's hear some more. Islam is causing lots of problems with rape, gangs, terrorism, and generally being a menace. Why? If I was going to oppose that statement, I would say perhaps yeah. it's a propagandistic conspiracy to blame what's happening in Europe on Islamic immigrants. The reason that Europe is clamping down on speech critical of Islam is partly the same reason that the entire Western world is clamping down on speech that's critical of anything that is associated with group identity. It's a consequence of the collective decision that we've made that egalitarianism and conflict avoidance constitute the two highest virtues and they trump everything else, including free speech. I suspect to some degree that it's a consequence of women becoming involved in the political system. Women are more agreeable by nature than men and agreeable people are agreeable. compassionate towards those they see as suffering and that seems to include any minority, especially when you combine that with a kind of neo-Marxist doctrine that <laughs> that anyone who has an advantage what? swiped it and I think in the Islamic situation you get a real conflict there because it's obviously the case that many Islamic practices are not commensurate with postmodern neo-Marxist feminism let's say but they seem what? to get a free pass and I guess that's because there's a fair bit of revolutionary fervor in the more radical end of the left political spectrum <laughs> and that radical fervor is devoted towards tearing down the patriarchy and of course that's basically western civilization what? and no. so because islam isn't part of western civilization then it can be seen as an ally in that in that uh, attempt okay wait a minute bucko holy crap uh people take this guy seriously wait a lot of that actually sounded really familiar well, i wouldn't say that there's evidence that national identity is biological but the proclivity to form tribal identity is most certainly part of our biological structure. I suspect to some degree that it's a consequence of women becoming involved in the political system. Women are more agreeable by nature than men and agreeable people are compassionate towards those they see as suffering. You know, there's, there's a rule that I attempted to abide by when I had small children and the rule was don't do anything for your children that they can do themselves. And you do that with setting the table, and you do that with everything. It's like, no, it's okay, you do that now. Well, I care for you so much, let me do that for you. It's like, I don't care for you at all when I say that. I don't care for you at all. I'm going to stop doing everything I possibly can for you as rapidly as I possibly can. 2001, yes. 
Yes, 9-11. What's emerged? What's happened? One answer to that is that the towers fell. It's a very, very poor answer because that was an unknown unknown. Buildings fell, but the thing is the buildings aren't isolated. They weren't buildings exactly. They were only buildings at the most superficial level. First of all, they had 5,000 people in them and they were networked at multiple levels. So they were family members, but they were also elements in the financial and economic machine. And in the political machine, what was hit was of course not just the buildings, but the economic and political system. Those buildings were probably attached to everything in every possible way. Things took a vicious turn after that, and almost immediately, right, the whole political system readjusted itself. It became much more authoritarian. Well, and then we got tangled up even worse in the Middle East, and we have no idea where that's going to end. And it's not like the people who planted the bomb didn't know that. Like, here's what they thought. The Soviet Union, that was the second greatest power on Earth, and then they waded into Afghanistan. And they got tangled up in a terrorist war, and oh, poof, ten years later they didn't exist. It's like, maybe we could do the same thing to the United States. It's like, well, who knows? Maybe you could. Okay, we've had fun, but that's all coincidental. Wait, there was one other point. What was it? How much tyranny you have to impose in order to produce something like equality of outcome. The, the, and Thomas Sowell's talked about this a little bit too. He said, what people who are agitating for equality of outcome don't understand is that you have to cede so much power to the authorities, to the government, in order to ensure equality of outcome that a tyranny is inevitable. All right, and then there was an Orwell quote. Let's see what Orwell might say about someone like Peterson. The writer either has a meaning and cannot express it, or he inadvertently says something else. Or he is almost indifferent as to whether his words mean anything or not. As soon as certain topics are raised, the concrete melts into the abstract. Uh, Peterson also cites Orwell, weirdly enough. I started reading George Orwell when I was a kid. Orwell's definitely one of my intellectual heroes from the 20th century. He's been a hero of mine consistently. I read 1984, An Animal Farm, of course. 1984. Neat. In the long run, a hierarchical society was only possible on a basis of poverty and ignorance. The right can say, well, yeah, we need the damn hierarchies and they need to be buttressed. And the left can say, yes, but they have to be maintained properly so they don't deteriorate and degenerate. When the left goes too far, it does something like say, well, how about no hierarchies? It's like, no, how about not? Wrong. Maybe don't cite an anarchist as one of your biggest influences if you tend to advocate for strict hierarchies of power. In Alice in Wonderland, when Alice goes down the rabbit hole... Anyway, I don't think I'm going to find an example of someone arguing for equality of outcome or result. I don't think anyone actually argues for that. Equality of provision? Sure. But it's not like everyone is looking for the same outcome with their work. This stuff is starting to sound kind of conspiratorial, and I'm afraid I'm going to start running into globalist conspiracy theorizing. So let's actually talk about the source of this myth. Milton Friedman. See if I can drag this nightmare back into alignment. Milton Friedman's Free to Choose was a video series and a book of the same name. Let's see his justification for this set of assertions and assumptions. Much of the moral fervor behind the drive for equality comes from the widespread belief that it is not fair that some children should have a great advantage over others simply because they happen to have wealthy parents. Of course it's not fair. But is there any distinction between the inheritance of property and the inheritance of what at first sight looks very different? These youngsters have inherited wealth, not in the form of bonds or stocks, but in the form of talent. That 15-year-old is an accomplished cellist. I'm sure just about anyone can become an accomplished cellist by the age of 15, based entirely on the... Are, are you serious? You chose a minimum... $3,000 instrument for this argument? See why I solely use basketball example now. At least it's a an affordable hobby for the poor who don't have generational wealth, like having access to a fucking cello. Uh, the book has a chapter about equality and a subsection on equality of outcome. Let's check that out. Equality, Outcome, Dodo from Alice, Karl Marx, and Orwell. Christ, I thought I was gonna have to try. I've already addressed 
all of the straw man used in this book thanks to weird conspiracy web 2.0 sites and Jorpa. If I had to boil this argument down to something digestible, it would have to be the founding fathers wrote equality into the constitution, but that meant equality before God. Then we achieved equality of opportunity in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Then the writers, the writings of Karl Marx and the consequent failure of the USSR are calling for equality of outcome. Since this is the case, it must be assumed that Democrats are advocating for equality of outcome as a ruse for government control. As a consequent result of this, feminism has gone from the liberation of women to the utopian egalitarian ideal. This has led to words meaning things other than what they literally mean or used to mean. Therefore, the left, you know, that monolith, is trying to destroy Western civilization through post-Marxist, post-modern neo-Marxist feminism because the left advocates for equal access to education, housing, food, and health care. Okay, like, if that's really the game you're playing, I have to concede, because that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And I await people trying to tell me that this isn't what these people are saying, uh, because I have cited my sources, all of my sources, right under my Patreon and Twitter links. I haven't made a claim yet. I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where the hell this argument came from. Uh, and all I can discern is that it's a straw man conspiracy theory that is frequently conjured to fear monger about government control in service of furthering authoritarianism, which just is government control. I wanted this to be a short video, man. Really did. I wait feedback. I look forward to comments, although if you are rude, I will remove it. There is no reason to disrupt your classmates. Um, I have been Luna, and I will see you later. I'm gonna go, like, study Orwell's works or something for a while. Bye. My hair. Should I have just gone full, like, Boris Johnson on this? Like, look at that. What's going on here? I need a haircut.